today's uh, sermon, we start John chapter 4. We're going to cover part of it today, and it's a story that we have heard over and over again many times. We're going to call it today what everybody else calls it, I think, when they preach on this bit of scripture, the woman at the well, which is why I said your prayer kind of touched on it a little bit today, Brother Jeremiah, and some of those songs kind of touched on it. Um, what's that song? We used to sing it at Round Prairie. Like the woman at the well. I was seeking things that did not satisfy. That one. Fill me up, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. Um, I think we are all seeking for things that don't satisfy. Um, and I'll give you an example. I'll just point fingers totally at me here. You all can draw from my examples and, and do what you want. But my wife and I used to be what we called consumers. Now, we're still consumers by the technical stamp, you know, definition term. But, man, we just bought everything. We would just go shop, shop till you drop. We would go out on a fri- on a Saturday early in the morning. Sometimes we'd get up early and go out for breakfast at a nice breakfast place, have some bacon and eggs. Um, and then we would shop all day. We'd go to lunch somewhere. We'd catch a movie in the afternoon. We'd go shop some more. We'd eat an early dinner, have some drinks, come home. We did that every Saturday. And back then, we would spend like $200. And that was a lot of money for us then. And and we'd have nothing to show for it. And I think if you did that today, you'd spend more. Because we would take our two or three kids, depending on how many we had at the time, with us when we did that. Um, And I used to buy a lot of things out of catalogs. Just buy, buy, buy. And I was just like trying to fill this hole, I think, in me. When when I actually sat down and started thinking about it, why am I doing this? I think there was this hole that I was just trying to fill. And that hole can only be filled by what? Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus, right? That's the only way that the hole can be filled. Um, And so we're constantly seeking for things that that don't satisfy. Again, I'm just, (laughs) this isn't even in my notes. I'm just going with it right now because I thought about it while we were singing. Um... Alcohol, drugs, things like that that people are into, it's because they have a big hole in their life, and that hole is where Yeshua is supposed to be. Since last Tuesday, I have not had, I've had one cup of coffee since last Tuesday. I've had no alcohol. Um, I was kind of motivated a little bit, I think, because I did it without thinking about it consciously, and in a retrospect, I was thinking, last week, Sister Kate passed out the flyer, or the, I don't know, the something from Straightway, Kansas City. And they're kind of doing a run-up to the Day of Atonement. And so they have a series of fasts of different kinds that they're doing. And, and I read it. And, you know, I, I took it in and I, I thought about what they were doing. And um, quite frankly, the reason that I just stopped drinking coffee and alcohol, and I'm not saying it's forever, but I just felt like, you know what? I like this too much, both of them. And so I'm just going to see what I'm like without them. It's kind of just what I'm doing. It's just kind of my thing. you got to push yourself every now and then. And I think that we really, um, and this applies to everybody, we should only be dependent on him. We shouldn't even be dependent on our spouse to, to the higher degree. Now, obviously, I'm dependent on Sister Kate for all kinds of things, and she's dependent on me for all kinds of things. And there's that relationship that goes on. But in the big picture, we should only be dependent on him. If we do have him, everything else should be sufficient. Um, in a spiritual sense. And sometimes I think we let physical things get in the way. So that that's just no idea why I went there. But I did. All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Father. John chapter 4. Let's read a little bit. When therefore the Lord knew how... Now this is Yeshua, the Master knew how the Pharisees had heard that Yeshua made and baptized more disciples than John, though Yeshua himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea. So here's the deal. The Pharisees, they know what's going on. They were watching John, and here's this Yeshua guy. He gets his own. He comes up out of nowhere. He comes up out of the water. John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Um, He gathers his own disciples. And then last week we talked about how the disciples were kind of maybe getting a little jealous. Um, and they went back to John, and John's like, hey, whoa, man, that's not my, that's not my gig. That's his gig. He's doing it. Um, but the Pharisees have taken notice. 
and it is not time for Yeshua to have a confrontation with the Pharisees yet. And so he takes his guys and he books. He leaves. So he leaves Judea and he departs again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. So, he had to go through Samaria. What does it say in another version? Somebody give me another version of he must needs go through Samaria. And he had to pass through Shomeron. All right, Shomeron. We're going to get to that too. Um, he didn't have to. In fact, most Jews, it was the shortcut. It was the direct route to where he was going through Shomeron, through Samaria. Yeah. But most Jews would go around Samaria. And we're going to get into that heavy today. Um, but they would. And so for him to go where he was going, he's going <laughs> through Samaria. Now, I just want to read this next part. And then we're going to come back and kind of go through it. So you can read along with me. So he comes to a city in Samaria, which is called Sychar, or Sychar, near to the parcel of of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Yeshua, therefore, being wearied and with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Yeshua says unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat, to buy food. And then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, not even walking through. 10. And Yeshua answered, and he said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Yeshua answered, and he said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water... Excuse me, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Yeshua said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Yeshua said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast five husbands, and he who thou now hast is not thy husband. If thou, in that thou saidest truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Yeshua said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, we're going all back through that, but I just wanted to read that. Now, I have heard sermons on this before. Y'all have probably heard sermons on this before. And people, for all I know, tomorrow, Sunday... First day could hear sermons on that. And typically, the key point out of that, and most pastors won't read that whole thing, um, but the key parts that they'll bring out is either verses 14 and 15, which is, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman says, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And so it's like, if you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. It's kind of what I talked about this morning. It's true, right? It's a true statement, but that's the main point that gets hammered home. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. And if you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. If you're full of him, you're just full continually. And, and that'll be the theme of the sermon. And the whole sermon will draw on that with examples. The other verse that people, uh, pastors, pick out of this is 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. 
and he seeks those people who worship him in spirit and truth, and then they try to draw a sermon out of that, um, which unfortunately some people can't quite get to that. Um, but you'll hear those two verses, or those three verses, come out of that chunk of scripture, and that's what it's focused on. And it's like this woman, you know, and they, they'll touch on Samaria, and they didn't get along with Samaritans, and maybe go over here to the good Samaritan. Brothers and sisters, there is so much here in this chunk of scripture. Um, get ready for a ride. Take notes. This is this is a fascinating bit of scripture. I actually had to break this sermon in half. So next week, y'all willing, um, we're going to do part two. So we're going back to the beginning a little bit. Back around four. <clears throat> I need my water. Excuse me. <clears throat> so first thing we should probably talk about is where is this taking place? place, this, this story that we're reading about. In uh, verse 3, we can read that he's going to Galilee, right? That, that's what that means, he's going to Galilee, but in verse 4 it says he's where? Shomeron. Shomeron, okay, in your Bible, in this Bible, and what most people think about it in English is Samaria, right? He's going to, he's in Samaria. Does anybody know where Samaria is today? Yes, it's northeast. You're looking on a map. No, yeah, you're not. Well, it was northwest of Jerusalem. Right. It's northwest of Jerusalem. It's in what we call the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, that area, right? So, like, you probably don't want to go there, um, just saying. But that's where Samaria is. And then um, he needed to go through Samaria. And so he's going through Samaria, verse 5, and he comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. What does it say in, uh, in Shechem? Shechem. Shechem. Right, Sicker. Let's learn a little bit about this place. I should probably put a ribbon here. Turn with me now. Genesis chapter 33. Sicker. Shechem. See, if you have a good Bible, like obviously Brother Fletch does, you can skip a little bit to the chase. Skip the chase. Genesis chapter 33 is where we're going. Somewhere around verse 18. I need to learn the Pastor Dow style of flipping. All right. Yes. Genesis 33, 18. Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar, and he called it El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. All right, so Jacob bought that land, just like the woman said, hey, Jacob bought this land, dug this well, which he fed his children and his cattle. And, you know, so she knows, this woman knows the history of this, and this is all the way back here in Genesis. He bought it for how much? A hundred. hundred. All right. Turn forward to Genesis chapter 48. Verse 13. This is when the blessings happened when Joseph. So Jacob became, what did his name change to? Israel. He had how many sons? Twelve. One of them was Joseph. Yeah. All right. So Joseph had two sons. That we're concerned about? And Manasseh. Manasseh. Time to bless them comes. All right, so Joseph took them both. Verse 13 in Genesis 48. Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand. And Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand. What's the power hand? Right. So who is Joseph trying to have blessed? Ephraim. Manasseh. 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 Towards Israel's right hand, and he brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand, and he laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Manasseh was supposed to get the right hand on him, and, and else, elsewise, left hand for, for Ephraim. Uh, but no, that's not what's happening here. And he blessed Joseph, and he said... God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. 
and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused, and he said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Does anybody have a different word in your Bible for I have given thee one portion above your brothers? So the firstborn gets the double portion, except in this case Reuben messes up, so he doesn't get it. So Joseph is getting a portion. The word for portion in Hebrew, here comes the first cool thing today, is Shechem. The town Shechem is named for portion. It's the same word in Greek, which it says in the King James, Sicker or Syker, or however you want to pronounce that, which is what it says in the uh, King James. And I have a note here that says both Abraham and Jacob bought property at Shechem. All right, and so there's one thing about Shechem. And 22, the last verse in chapter 48. Says what? Yep, it's on a mountain slope. We're going to get to that. All right. So now let's one more turn to Joshua chapter 24. I would actually like to preach this sermon in a circle. I would like to go all the way around the circle. I'm not going to. And then go around it again. Because what we what you're going to understand is that the woman that Yeshua had that conversation with that we already went over, he had a whole conversation with her. She understood all of this at once. She knew what Shechem was. She knew he spoke a lot between the lines, underneath the lines. And she was picking up on all of it. Um, and... We have to, unfortunately, because we're Greek mindsetted, we have to go point by point by point by point. And at the end, when you see all those points together, it's like, whoa. All right, so we're in Joshua chapter 24. I think around 31. And I'm going to start in 29. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Serah, which is in the Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And Israel served Yahweh all the days of Joshua. That means the nation of Israel served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua which had known all the works of Yahweh that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, same place, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Now, Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died. And they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. This is an interesting... Well, we're talking about Shechem, all right? And so that, that's what's going on there. This little last note right there, we're going to come back to... We're not going to actually come back to this verse, but I want you to remember this. Eleazar is the son of who? Aaron. Aaron the high priest. Eleazar the high priest. And it says he was buried in, in the land of Phinehas... Pincus, I think is, is what it says in scriptures, is his name, his son. So who do you think took over after Eliezer? Pincus, right? Phineas. 
Remember Phineas? Mm -hmm. We talked about Phineas a little while ago. Spear? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go back to John. We're still talking about Shechem. Because, see, this is all taking place in Shechem, and that is setting the stage for everything that's being said. And you have to understand that Yeshua obviously knew this, and this woman, she knows her history. Right? She's like, hey, this is the land, you know, that, that uh, my fathers have been at, that uh, Joseph, Doug, blah, 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 blah. Um, Shechem also was the capital of the kingdom of Israel. When the tribes split, can they go their way? They go to the northern kingdom, goes to Samaria, kingdom of Israel. Shechem is the, one of the capital cities. All right, they had a couple, but that was one of the capital cities. And today... It's near what is called, the because Shechem was destroyed by the Romans. Shechem no longer exists as, a, as even a town. Um, but very close to it, uh, like half a mile away, is the town of Nablus, which is actually in the news sometimes, like most towns in the West Bank, because there's violence there and stuff like that. Um, West Bank, Palestinian Authority, and it's on the slope of, it's in a valley between two mountains, Gerizim in the north and Ebal in the south. We'll come back to those mountains in, in a little bit. Um, but that's where they are. All right. So, <clears throat> that's the location. So he comes to the city of Samaria, which is called Shechem, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. All right, and we just read about that. And that little piece of ground has some history that is well known to all parties. Now, Jacob's well was there. Check it out. Jacob's well is still there. It's a very deep well, and it has water in it, and they know exactly where this well is. So they know where Yeshua sat. Now, there's a lot of things in the Holy Land, like if you go do the Holy Land tour, and they say, this is that, and this is that, that they don't know. That It's just like it's assumed, and it's like, yeah, this is where this was. This. But if you do real research, it's like, no, they don't know. They know where this well is. You can actually go sit at that well. Actually, you probably can't. There's probably like a fence around it or something. I don't know, but they know where that is. All right. <clears throat> Yeshua, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it's about the sixth hour. What time's the sixth hour? Noon. noon. So it's noon. It's hot. It says Yeshua is wearied. What, what can we derive just from that little bit right there? Man. He's a fully man. Fully man. He's God. He can do anything. He was also fully man, and he was tired. It's the middle of the day. They've been walking. They've been walking through Nazareth, and he needs to take a little sit down. And so he does. <clears throat> there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. That's verse 7. So she's coming at what time? Noon. Why is she coming at noon? When do you think most women draw water despite morning, morning or night? Yeah. But usually morning, they all get together. It's kind of like one of their first chores, right? They go get the water. And it's also gossip time, right? Oh, how are you doing? No, 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 no. You know, it's just talking, catching up, doing those things. It's kind of like ladies' time, right? She's coming at noon. Why is she coming at noon? <laughs> she's got water at home and she's got it. I think she's an outcast. I think she's not accepted by her own people. It doesn't say. Um, so that's not too important to the story. Um, but, you know, we find out later because we've already read it. Oh, yeah, shit, you're an adulteress, man. You know, and so maybe that wasn't going over well. I mean, if she's been sleeping with all these husbands, maybe the other women don't really want to hang around her, yeah. right? Because they kind of like their man. And so, you know, maybe there's some of that going on. But it's noon, and she's coming to draw water. That is not a typical time to draw water, especially in the Middle East. Why? Because what's it like here in the summertime at noon? Stinking hot. You want to be pumping, pulling water up a well, throwing it in a jar, carrying it around and stuff? Heck no. You want to do that when it's cool. And so, there you go. So... <clears throat> Jesus, Yeshua, says to her, give me a drink. Very direct. Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So we can take from that, and I've talked about this a little bit in the past, the whole Eastern way. You know, if you, if you study at an old, which I don't even know if they have any more old dojos in America, um, but when I was a kid, they had some old-style uh, places to study martial arts where the instructors were from Asia, you know, Korea or Japan primarily, sometimes China if you were in California, and you had to do things the old way, which meant, oh, Karate Kid. Has, has anybody here not seen Karate Kid? So you know how he makes him wax all his cars? Wax on, wax off? 
it, it's funny to an American mind. It's like, I'm here to learn karate. You're making me wax your cars. That's a very Eastern thing. If you're going to serve the master, you're going to serve the master. I know you want to learn karate, but first you're going to go wax my cars. And, and, you know, there's some brilliance in that later that you learn in the movie. But um, it is expected that Yeshua is not going to draw his own water. His disciples are going to draw his water. And that's why the little footnote there, but his disciples were away buying food. And so he's hanging out and tells her to do it. Verse 9. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. <clears throat> Today, most Orthodox Jews won't even talk to another woman. Right? It, it kind of freaks them out when Sister Kate says things to them in grocery stores. <laughs> They don't want to talk to another woman, um, let alone a Samaritan woman. Now, <clears throat> keep a finger here. We're coming back. We're going to 2 Kings. Why do the Jews not like the Samaritans? What is the rift between the Jews and the Samaritans? Let's go to 2 Kings, shall we? Now, you're going to have to put a ribbon or a pen or something in this part of 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 24 because we're coming back to here a couple times. Because you're going to have to see there, there is some wonderfulness in the story we're reading right here in this part of 2 Kings. So we're going to come back to it a couple times. Right now, we're just going to read. I'm going to read a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 17. Uh, I'll start in 23. Until Yahweh removed Israel out of his sight, as he said by all his servants, the prophets. Northern kingdom getting taken over by the Assyrians, okay? Because of their disobedience and so on. So was Israel carried away out of their own land into Assyria unto this day. What happened to the ten tribes? This is the ten tribes that get carried away. Nobody knows, right? <coughs> that's, the, that's the story, right? They're gone. They get carried away unto this day is what it says. Yeah, and to this day, they're gone. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Kutha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they possessed Samaria, and they dwelt in the cities thereof. So here's the deal. When, back in the day, when they conquered a land, they killed and, rem and who they didn't kill, they killed all the people. And who they didn't kill, they removed from the land. They, they took them as slaves and they took them out of the land because they didn't want them starting a guerrilla war. They don't want any problems. I know you think this is your land that your father had and his grandfather had and he's had. Guess what? It's not your land anymore. If you leave that person there as a slave, he's going to resent it. He's going to want to do it all the time. So they removed them. So now they've got this whole captured land and they just took all the people out of it. We got to fill it up with people. We got to make it productive. We we have to do things, and so they would bring other captured people in and resettle them. So it's kind of moving everybody around to keep them off guard. It, it was a tactic that they did, and so that's what they do. And so it was at the beginning of the dwelling there that they feared not Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Now, when I read that, I went back to the Torah portion we did fairly recently where Yah is telling his people, as you go into the new land, I'm not going to let you get it all at once. I'm not going to let you take it all at once because wild animals could come in and take over and then you got to fight the wild animals too. So you're going to take a little bit of time. So I think there's a little bit of that going on. I think they came in, depopulated the countryside, and then it's like, all right, General Fletch, I need you to start sending me people. Roger, they're on the way. And they're not getting there so soon, and so there's animals, and the people that are there are getting eaten up by these wild beasts. All right, so that's what's going on. But Yah sends them, and um, Yah sends lions among them, wild animals, and they slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria, the Israelites, no, not the, uh, excuse me, no, not the Israelites, all those people he brought in and replaced them with, no, not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of this land. So they're saying, hey, you sent these strangers into the land. They don't understand the God that controls this land. And because of that, he's ticked, and he's sending these lions in to kill them. So 
the king of Assyria, verse 27, commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. So he says, all right, bring a holy man back, bring him back, let him teach them the ways to worship Yahweh, right, this God. And then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear Yahweh. 29, how be it every nation made gods of their own, and they put them in houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Sukkot Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephirvites burnt their children in the fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. And they feared, so they feared Yahweh, and they made unto themselves the lowest of them, priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared Yahweh and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. So they kind of did both. It's like, hey guys, we're in Yahweh's land here, so we got to do this Yahweh stuff this Israelite stuff, but we're also going to worship our own gods too. And so they kind of have this amalgamated uh, religion going on. 34. Unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not Yahweh, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and the commandments which Yahweh commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom Yahweh had made a covenant and charged them, saying... This is important. Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But Yahweh, who brought you up out of the land of Mitzrayim with great power and a stretched out arm, him ye shall fear, and him ye shall worship, and to him ye shall do sacrifice. And the statutes, and the ordinances, and the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, ye shall observe and do forevermore. And ye shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget, neither shall you fear other gods. But Yahweh your Elohim you shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Howbeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared Yahweh, and they served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers. So do they unto this day. Coexist, baby. The Pope evidently just said something. I just saw the headline. I didn't feel like going into it. That everybody's worshiping the same God in their own way. That's evil. That, that's not true. That's what these guys are doing. This is the Samaritans. They do it to this day. right? This is, this is what the Jews believe. And so the Jews, the Israelites that lived in you know, that part, the Jews at that time, looked on these Samaritans as these like apostate, Pagan worshiping, just ugh. how could you take the truth of the of Almighty Yah and pervert it like that? That what you do, and that's why the Jews hated them. It's it's a lot of what's going on today between the Sunnis and the Shia. We look at them, most of us, and go, yeah, they're Muslims. They hate us. Yeah, they hate each other more. That's kind of funny. Um, and so that's what was going on from the Jewish perspective to the Samaritans, which is why. They would walk around Samaria. They wouldn't talk to Samaritans. There's no way they would help a Samaritan. And the fact that a Samaritan and the Good Samaritan helps a Jew is like an amazing thing. All right. So that's from the the uh, that's from the the Jewish side. Uh, their history. We are coming back here. So put a finger there. All right. Let's go back to John. So now you know where they are. Now you know a little bit of the history of what's going on there. Verse 10. <clears throat> Yeshua answered and he said unto her, If you knew the gift of... Now it says God here. He, he's What is he speaking? What do you think? Aramaic. 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 Check this out. The Samaritans today, does anybody have any idea... How many Samaritans there are today? There are Samaritans, yes. 700. Yep, there's 700 something Samaritans. That's it, 700. They, they live out there, they're worshiping um, Yah, <coughs> and there's 700 of them. And, does anybody, did you look this up? 
I'm after the little. Other than Sister Kate, does anybody know what their writing is? Aramaic. It's a version of Paleo Hebrew. That's all I know, but I'm really interested now. Like, I want to do more research on these Samaritans, because we're going to tell you more about Samaritans later in this discussion. I kind of gave you the current Jewish thought on Samaritans. They have their own thought, which we'll get into. All right. So, <clears throat> Yeshua answered, he says on her, If you knew the gift of Elohim and who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink. You would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. I'm just going to read through 15. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and all his cattle? And Yeshua answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, this water and this well. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Verse 10 and verse 14 have a very common thing in them. In that one conversation. Yeshua brings up in verse 10 living water. And that means water that doesn't end. It just continually replenishes, replenishes, replenishes. He's talking to her about this well, this hole that's dug in the ground that has water in it. Yeah, well, drink of this water. This water never ends. This well is never going to run dry. And then if you look at verse 14, um, if you drink of this water, you shall never thirst. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's just continuing. So it's the same theme. It's the same concept. Now, here's the thing. That, that's why I told you earlier you know, you drink a Jesus and you don't need anything else. Well, this resonated with this woman also. Um, and, and quite frankly, with everybody in that region at the time. Let us look at Jeremiah. Chapter 2. This well of living water. See, because we read that and that's what we think. The water's never ending. It's just going to continually flow. Okay, got it. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. So does anybody know one of Ocho, Ocho's Hebrew name? Ami. Ami. Lo Ami, right? My people? From Lo Ami? Lo Ami is not my people. Ami is my people. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So, who is Yah referring to himself as? What is he referring to himself as? Fountain of, drink, uh, of everlasting water, ever flowing water. And he's talking about hewing out, now in this case, cisterns, which were made out of rock. It's like a, a, a sink, if you will, in the ground. But it's hewing out, and this woman just spoke about digging a well, right? Where is this the well that you dug, blah, 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 that fed all the people? Where are you going to get this water from? And so he, he starts using the phraseology of living water, and this right here, Yah is referring to himself as living waters and refers to not this cistern that you're digging out. Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 13, again. O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Yahweh, the fountain of living waters. Yeshua did not pick these terms just out of the top of his head. He wasn't just referring to the well that he was sitting on. He was using imagery that this woman understood to her core. Also, who is this verse talking to? The hope of Israel, all that forsake you, shall be ashamed. What did the Samaritans do? They went after other gods, right, of the people that were there. They certainly knew that that's what the Jews thought they did, right? They knew why the Jews didn't like them. And so, the hope of all Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the fountain of living waters. 
me, Yahweh, the fountain of living waters. And so this imagery that he's telling her, because in this part when they're talking about water, they haven't talked about her adultery yet, right? But she knows, she's there at noon. She knows she's guilty. She knows that she's bad. She knows she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew. And her people, at least in the Jewish eyes, have forsaken Yah. The fountain of living waters. And so when he's using this terminology, he is hammering her. And she's, she's taking it on board. She's at first pretending not to. But I, I submit to you that she's taking it on board. Alright, so that was 15. <clears throat> woman says, hey, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Yeshua says unto her, <clears throat> so she says, okay, you sold me. I want the water. And so Yeshua, when she says that, says, okay, here's the water. Here's what you got to do. No, <laughs> no, no. Because what's the problem with the Samaritans? They worshipped other gods, right? They, they took on these other traditions of men, of the men they were surrounded by, these graven images. And so instead of, he tells her, hey, you need these living water. She says, okay, I want the living water. He doesn't give it to her right away. He calls her mind to something else. I'm getting chills because I know where I'm going with this. Yeshua says to her, go, call your husband. Tell him to come here. Now he just told her, if you'd ask for water, you'd never thirst again. They have a little back and forth about the water. And she's like, okay, you sold me. I want the water. He doesn't give her the water. He says, go get your husband. <clears throat> mm. <laughs> I know where we're going. <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> So the woman answered and she said, I have no husband. And she was said to her, you have well said that you have no husband. For you have five husbands. And he whom you now have is not your husband. In that you have truly said. I'm going to go forward, do that, and then come back. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Yeah. He's the stranger out of town. He knows she's got five husbands and she's living with somebody else. Our father worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place for men ought to worship. So we're going to talk about that mountain first. And we're going to go back and talk about five husbands. Mm -hmm. So that mountain, they're by the well. Now I told you that the two mountains there are Mount Gerizim and Mount Abal. All right, that's the two mountains that are right there where this is happening. They know where this is. The mountain she is talking about is a mountain called Gerizim. So turn with me now, please, to Deuteronomy 11. Deuteronomy 11.26 Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey my commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to what? To go after other gods which ye have not known. Starting to sound familiar? Starting to pick up the theme here? Okay, well, well, you said we're here for Gerizim. We are. And it shall come to pass when Yahweh thy Elohim has brought thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and you shall put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim. That's where Yeshua is sitting right now with this woman, on the, on the, on the bottom of it. And a curse upon Mount Ebal. And are they not on the other side of Jordan? By the way, where the sun goes down, in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the plain over against Gilgal, beside the plains of Moreh. For ye shall pass over Jordan, and go in to possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, and you shall possess it, and dwell therein. And you shall observe and do all the statutes and judgments that I set before you this day. Alright, so that's Gilgal. You're going to put people, blessings and curses. Um, what's going on Gilgal? Blessings. All right. Turn forward to chapter 27 in Deuteronomy. Chapter 
So he told them not to go after other gods, right? And if then, if then, blessings, curses. All right, 27, uh, verse 9. And Moshe and the priests of the Levites spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become a people of Yahweh thy Elohim. Covenant. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of Yahweh thy Elohim, and do his commandments and his statutes which I command you this day. And Moshe, what's the first commandment? No other gods before me. Wow. And Moshe charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim and bless the people when ye are come over. And he names tribes. And these shall stand over, verse 13, upon Mount Ebal to curse. And he names tribes. And the Levite shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto Yahweh, the work of his hands of a craftsman that putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. And then cursed is he, and cursed is he, and cursed is he. But the first one is worshiping other gods, making graven images, and all that. This is done at Gilgal, uh, uh, excuse me, Gerizim, and at um, Ebal. Last one, Joshua chapter 8. Eight and thirty. That's nine. Then Joshua built an altar unto Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, in Mount Ebal. And Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto Yahweh, and they sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moshe, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark, and on that side before the priests of the Levites, which bear the ark, the covenant of Yahweh, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moshe the servant of Yahweh had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, blessings and curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all of Moshe commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. Blessings and curses. If you do these things, all these blessings flow. If you don't do these things, all these curses are be, are coming against you. Here's Mount uh, Gerizim. Here's Mount Ebal. Rich history. Shechem. Everybody knows what's going on there. This woman knows this story. She knows that her people started following other gods, uh, which is the one thing they said not to do. Flip back to Kings, where I told you to put your second Kings, where I said put your finger. He says, go get your husband. She says, ah, <laughs> I got five husbands. I don't have a husband. I, I got five. Or, I don't have a husband. He goes, right, you got five. <clears throat> so verse 29 of 2 Kings chapter 17. This is the Samaritans. Every nation made gods of their own, and they put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Every nation and the cities wherein they dwelt. Now check it out. Here's the other thing um, that I didn't say and I should have. Northern tribes get exiled first, right? They get taken away by Assyria. They didn't all get taken. Okay, they didn't just bring, they didn't scour the land and take every single person. They took all the main people out. But kind of like the lowlifes, and the Jews believe this too, the lowlifes, the homeless people and stuff like that, pff, I'm not going to chase them through the woods. We got the towns and the cities, let's go. They still did bring back priests and stuff to teach. Then comes the Babylonian captivity. They go away. When they come back to the land, right, after the Babylonian captivity, the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those people now that we're dealing with in the New Testament, if you will, they're like, all right, finally, we're coming back to our land that Yahweh has given us. There's these people there. They're like, dude, this is our land. We've been here forever. We never left. We're the true Israelites. And they're like, oh, you're not. You follow. You worship these images of stone and wood. Yeah, but we worship Yahweh too. They're like, no, no, no. And they're like, this is our land. No, this is our land. No, this is our land. No, you didn't even build a temple. Da, da, da. And they go back and forth. And that's why they hate each other, right? And so that, that's more to the story there of what's going on. So um, 
Howbeit, every nation made gods of their own. This is the Samaritans that stayed. This is how they were looked upon. In the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation of cities wherein they dwelt. All right, verse 30. Count with me now. The men of Babylon, they made these, these kind of fake gods. The men of Cuth, they made these Nurgles. The men of Hamath, they made Ashamas. The Abites, they made these other things. And the Seraphites. How many is that? Four. That's, that's five. 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 Right. It's five. Those are the husbands. They went whoring after other gods. They took husbands, metaphorically speaking, of five other people. The Samaritans did. Yeshua's talking to this Samaritan woman. He goes, yeah, you got five husbands. Because you as a people went after five other groups, if you will, of gods. In addition to me. So, you know, you're, you're committing adultery there. Um, this is drilling this woman. This woman, that's why she says, <clears throat> back here in uh, John chapter 4. I lost my ribbon, so I've got to find it like you. There we go. He goes, yeah. She says, you have well said, I have no husband, verse 18, for you have five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. You said that truly. And the woman says to him, oh, you are a prophet. Can you see now why she says you're a prophet? Not just like you're some neuromancer or you're some clairvoyant person that knows I'm, I've got five husbands back in the rear. No, you're a prophet of Yah because what he's doing is calling her attention to everything that Samarita did, that Samaria did, the Samaritans did, with the five husbands, with the fact that the living water, you've rejected the living water, now you want the living water? Yeah, well, the first thing you're going to have to do is get rid of your five husbands. Unstated, but that's exactly what it is. Do you remember when the council met and they, about circumcision? And it's like, hey, what, you got to do these four things before you come here. Avoid things strangled, food offered to idols, blood, and... What was the other one? Fornication. Those four things were all worshiping other gods. That's what those four things were used, which is the same context here. You can't be worshiping any other gods. And so Yeshua is calling her mind to that right there. Now, <clears throat> the Samaritan story is similar. Assyrians come in. They captured us. A lot of us stayed back. Yes, we followed these other gods, but we really did worship Yahweh truly and what really happened was this guy, Eli, this is their story, the Samaritan story. They still have it today. This guy, Eli, was the, the head treasurer of Israel, and he did an offering, and he didn't do it right. He forgot to put salt on, on the thing on purpose because he was doing it carelessly because he didn't truly care about Yah because he was just going through the, through the motions. And Pincus, or the sons of Pincus, excuse me, the sons of Phineas, who was the son of... Eleazar, who is the son of Aaron, so coming down the priesthood, gets mad and rebukes this guy. And then this guy, Eli, says, that's it. I've had it. We're out of here. We're no longer worshiping where Moshe built the tabernacle on Mount Gerizim. Right? That, that's what they say. He built it at the true holy spot of Mount Gerizim. This guy, Eli, gets in a little contest, and he goes, we're out of here. And they go to Shiloh. Jerusalem and build the temple there. And they're like, we're worshiping the way he wants to be worshipped. Those Jews that left out of, out of spite were trying to overthrow the sons of Pincus, which now does start sounding like the Sunni Shia thing, because these are the direct line descendants of the high priest. That's very similar to what Sunni Shias are fighting about. And so they say there were three splits in Israel, the Samaritans do. The true believers in Yahweh, us the Samaritans, you silly Jews who went down to Jerusalem, and yes, there were some Israelites, Samaritans, who followed false gods. They say there's three divisions. The Jews said there's two. There's us who follow the true way, and all you who follow false gods. So can you see how the, this argument is going on? And it's all about Mount Gerizim. It's kind of where the whole thing started. And so this is what she's talking about. Um, <clears throat> and she says, wow, you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and, and y'all say that in Jerusalem is the place for men ought to worship. So now she's like, this guy's a prophet of God, but really 
We are told, I am told to believe that we worship on Mount Gerizim, and the big sticking point I have with you Jews is that you guys are in Jerusalem, and that all came about because of that argument I told you about, because they know their own story very well. And Jesus says, Yeshua says unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Whoa! Here's a Jew saying the time is coming when you're not going to worship in Jerusalem. Everybody knows five times a year you go up to, or three times a year you go up to Jerusalem. All Jews know the only place to truly worship the Most High Yah is in Jerusalem. And here's a Jew talking to a Samaritan who says, let me tell you something. Time's coming when none of this stuff, these little petty human arguments about do we worship them here or do we worship them there is going to matter. You worship what you know not. And we could go back to Kings, but I can see your eyes are starting to glaze over. They didn't know what they were worshiping. They just started picking up all the gods of the people that came in. It was like a big potpourri. Well, I guess we'll worship some Hindu stuff. I guess we'll worship some Buddhist stuff. I guess we'll worship some Muslim stuff. They didn't know what they were worshiping. And so he's calling her on that. Now remember, the whole reason he's doing this is because she says, I'm ready for that living water, and that living water is Yah. And so he's not just giving it to her, he's correcting her. And he's saying, hey, look, you've got to get rid of all this adultery. And then so she brings up the point, yeah, well, I don't know if I can go with you all the way because y'all worship in Jerusalem, and I've been told we worship here on Gerizim. And he goes, you don't even know what you worship. Salvation is of the Jews. The Jews are getting it. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. This nonsense is all going away. Here's the other really cool thing about that. You know, we preach and we talk, and it's true that the reason the Jews rejected Yeshua was so that the fullness, you know, Gentiles could come to him, and now everyone can come to the Father through Yeshua. The Jews rejected them, and so there's all those other parables. All right, fine. You don't want to come to the wedding feast? Well, invite everybody else, right? We, we know those stories. It's starting right here. He's telling her, you people who think that all these people that I hang with say you, you're not going anywhere? You're condemned? I'm telling you, the time's coming when these little differences we have are nothing. Worship Yah. Nonsense is going away. And the woman says to him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called the anointed. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Yeshua said unto her, I that speak unto you am he. It's like you're looking at him. Yeah, whoa, that's like, for me too, that's just like, whoa. you just laid bare my soul. You just described my entire history, not only of me personally, because I do believe she personally had all these husbands. But she also knew what he was talking about. Of me, my people, this land, in a simple little conversation, you just laid it bare, and then he tells me, <laughs> you're looking at him. You're looking for Messiah. Here I am. Um, it's interesting that he tells her, and, and she's a woman alone. Mm -hmm. Right? Two people sitting alone who aren't supposed to be together. Mm -hmm. Who's the first person that saw the resurrected Yeshua? Mary. Right? Woman alone. It's kind of interesting. Um, Another interesting thing about this bit of scripture that I read, Yeshua has seven chunks of conversation with this woman. Boom, 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 boom. What's seven? The number of? Spiritual perfection. Spiritual perfection. And they get, if you go through them all, um, I can take and put little notes in your Bible. The first one is uh, verse seven. Give me the drink. The second one is verse ten. If you knew the gift of God, who says to me, give me a drink. The third one is verse 13. Fourth one is 16. 17 is the fifth. 21 is six. They get stronger and stronger and stronger as it goes along. And then the last one is here in verse 26. Jesus says, I that speak unto you am he. I am the Messiah, the anointed of God. I think there's a lot more in that story than just Jesus' water that just continually refills, continually refills. 
First of all, that water, just on a slightly deeper look, that water is Yah, Yahweh. And then at the end he says, I am, I am the Messiah, the anointing of God also. Um, going back and looking at Mount Gerizim, looking at the promises that were made there, at the oath that was taken there by the people, at the things that were repeated in the word over and over and over again, basically you will have no gods before me. You will put nothing before me, which brings us back to the whole beginning of this thing. What are you putting before Yeshua? Nothing. I'm putting nothing before Yeshua. What is more important to you than Yeshua? I tell you, today, uh, no, yesterday was the first day that I got up and I wasn't like immediately looking for coffee. Like it's what I would do. I'd get up as I got out of bed. I say a little prayer before I get out of bed. But then when I got out of bed, I walk right to start doing coffee. And it's like, was that between me and Yeshua? I'm not saying that. If you love your coffee, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying I've started thinking in my life, what is coming? What am I putting between me and Yeshua? What is more important to me? I, I didn't make coffee a God, but you know what? If you read some of the cool, funny posts that my wife and I laugh about on her Facebook account that people do about coffee, some people do make it a God. And I'll finish with this because I guess I'm on a coffee kick. Um, I used to read this guy. He writes cartoons, and it's called The Naked Pastor, or NakedPastor.com. It has nothing to do with clothing. It's not talking about that. He means he's bared his, his soul to the, to the Father. And he has some really interesting... Matter of fact, I started reading his cartoons. He's a Canadian before I came to the way. And one of them that he has is, I love you. I, I'm not doing it justice. I, I care so much for you. I know you take care of me. You hold me in your hands. You guide my day. You give me strength. Dun, dun, dun. Just all these, all these phrases that you would think a Christian, uh, a believer, would attribute to God, or we would attribute to Yahweh, and they're all written. You know how you can write poems and they make a shape by how long you make the lines? It's written in the shape of a cup of coffee on a saucer. Right? And, and that was his point. You know, you guys are worshiping coffee like a god. Or you're worshiping beards like a god. I talked to Brother Luke. And Brother Luke has a, a trimmed beard right now. I said, dude, what's up with your beard? It was righteous. He goes, yeah, you know, I just started feeling like some people are making like an idol out of their beard. Um, things like that. So, again, it's a story where it's easy for us to look at those Samaritans and go, I would never worship bloggy bloggy, whatever that god's name was that they worship. We're not perfect. And there's room for us to, to do more. Um, I don't know. I think it's a great story. We can talk about it when we're done. Uh, let's pray.